Welcome back, my nomads. Welcome back to another big cast. I'm here with Zach again. What's going on, Zach? Hey, man. How you doing? Doing good. So uh, you you said that you had a good start. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you know, as as you know, it is the uh, Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, this weekend, right? So I figured, Word. what better way to start off the New Year than some New Year's resolution in the middle of September? Okay. <laughs> one why not one upsets like yes i am growing a mustache it's going to be fantastic by oh the end God. of you know the week for sure this is just like you know a day's worth but anyway um i promised myself that i uh, no matter how bad a series gets i'm going to finish it to completion i.e star wars this guy i feel like you can't say the same what's going on with that so, per your request offline, I told you that I was going to continue watching Ahsoka. You was like, no, you got to finish it. We'll talk about it. So, I am up to date on Ahsoka. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. All right. Well, here's the thing. All right. Let's not spoil it because it's still kind of new. Let's just kind of go into. Um, I mean, we could spoil it. I mean, we don't release it right. We don't release these right when they we record them. So. No, nah, but still. So at the end of the day, I feel like where they're at right now is kind of where it should have been. You get what I'm saying? And instead of instead of just kind of have like a Rebels continuation without anyone explaining the background of these characters, because not everyone watched Rebels, that's not exactly fair to assume of everyone. You kind of mm -hmm. have to give like a reminder because I don't know that that video you sent me this morning made a really good point on uh hey, it was like I don't remember Sabine being trained by Ahsoka the first time as a Jedi. And come to find out she wasn't and Thank everyone's you. like wait a minute did we miss something from rebels from x amount of years ago i felt the same way <laughs> i was like what's going on here um so i sent zach a video of jeremy johns i'm a fan and his his movie and tv reviews are usually spot on and he made the point like yeah like i watched rebels i Loved it, but then it was like watching this was like, what's going on? Who did she train? Did Ahsoka train Sabine and everything? And um, I the the video I sent you his review of Ahsoka so far, I agree with everything he said. Like my thing is like, if you're gonna make Rebels season five, then make Rebels season five. Don't sit there and say Ahsoka the series, and it's just Rebels season five. And then when you try to make a Rebel Seasons 5, it doesn't feel like a Rebel Seasons 5 because, yeah, we've seen all these characters before for those who've watched it, and the live-action counterparts don't act like the... They're emotionalists. They're very boring, and he does have a point where the, the characters see, like, this is not... This is when live action should be better than the cartoon version because you can have that emotion, you can have that interpersonal like relationship and all the you know all that stuff to it, right? That kind of you should assume and expect from a live action. Now the the fantastical parts where it's like kind of crazy with the stunts and everything is kind of like you kind of leave it to the animated part, right? But there hasn't really and he made another good point about the lore, about, like, how does Ray Stevenson's character even know about Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker when how many people actually knew about it, one. And two, I feel like the lore, in terms of what people are theorizing, is way more fun than actually what's happening. And it's going to be a huge disappointment of how this actually comes to fruition. Good point. Because when it comes to Balin, Balin Skull, amazing name, by the way, um, like, wasn't it a secret that Anakin was Darth Ahsoka Vader? Ahsoka only knew because after the fact, when she fought Darth Vader and she realized who he was. Which and what she happened had in a Rebels. Feeling, right, and she had a feeling like, wait a minute, this is kind of familiar. And then she gets confirmation when Ezra saves her. So it's just... It, but, but that's the way... And then Obi-Wan fi finds out 10 years after the fact... Yeah, so I'm like, yo, everybody How in the know is knowing 
Because didn't the chick in Obi Wan Kenobi, forgive me, forgive me, I forget her name, the black chick, the villain, she knew too that he was Anakin Skywalker. So I'm like, does everybody know? How do they know? How do they know? (laughs) What if, what if, what, what if Balin is a clone of Anakin? That would be dope. So let's let's go on a wild theory, Star Wars theory. Even though we know, say? even though Ahsoka he fits is the proven, age, he fits the age. Even though um all the uh except for Andor, all the Star Wars series have let us down. All the Star Wars Disney Plus content has let us down when it comes to theorizing stuff and what could happen. Let's just go on a wild goose chase. Let's say he is the clone of Anakin Skywalker. He fits the age. So does that mean he has all the memories of Anakin Skywalker? Because then it would be a, a complete copy as opposed to Balin feels like a whole different guy, like person. You know what I'm saying? Like he just feels different. Various Star Wars mediums have already hinted at cloning Jedi, right? Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Jedi Survivor, mm-hmm. we're already starting to merge this idea into an actual theory, right? So just something to think about. I really, you know, I don't really like get into this too much just because it is like I, I had a lot of expectations because Soka started off so great. And then I started seeing cust- like the character interactions with each other. I'm like, why does it feel like I have this feeling that no one can stand each other when they talk I feel to each like other. I feel like everybody in the show is bored and if you're bored I'm bored <laughs> you know what I'm saying but what if Balin is star killer yeah or star killer was supposed to be the inquisitor and he ended up biting the dust so you know yeah literally <laughs> but star killer I no keep him not canon because star killer was just so overpowered yeah he pulled a, a star destroyer out the sky. I was like, "This guy is OP." After that cutscene, and then you play as Star Killer, you do a regular stuff. But Star Killers, <laughs> Star Killers, a clone anyway. Yeah, and then they clone him in the uh, Second Force one. Unleashed two. Yeah, yeah, but well, wasn't um, he originally a clone anyway? A clone of who? He I don't know, like, but wasn't he originally? He made? was one of the Jedi's sons. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Remember that cutscene where Darth Vader kills a Jedi and the boy is sitting right there. He takes a boy, trains him, names him Star Killer. But um, yeah, like I don't know. He he could be an Anakin clone. He could. I don't think he will. I mean, this happens all the time. People are like, "Oh, what's good?" It's not just it's not just Star Wars. Is anything Disney Plus like Disney Plus Marvel and Disney Plus Star Wars does this? Like they. They start off strong, and then they set things up. They're like, oh, there's going to be a great reveal, and such and such is going to come out the shadows, and da-da. Never happens. <laughs> now, the only show that's live up to his name is Andor. And Mandalorian season one and two were great. It's just, well, not, well, season one was great. Season two was good, solid. Season three was bad, you know. But Disney Plus... It's like it doesn't know what to do with Star Wars at all. You know, it's it's like it's like uh what's that movie that uh Ryan Johnson did? What's it called? Lovely. After no, episode eight, what was that called? Oh, um Force Awakens, uh it doesn't matter. Episode eight, the one that Ryan Johnson shot, um, we forgot it for a reason. Um, it, it feels like these shows are just that movie in longer form. Like all these shows kind of just fall by the wayside and they set these things up and then they're like, Oh, that thing that we set up means nothing to you. <laughs> it means nothing. I don't even know that. episode nine's name. Not going to lie. Rise of Skywalker. I want to say. Oh, the only reason I remember that is because it had the dumbest ending. It was like, Hey, what's your name? Skywalker and I'm like no you're not a Skywalker I'm not going to accept you're a Palpatine shut your face I knew she was a Palpatine since episode 7 and people didn't believe me I knew she was a Palpatine but she didn't earn that Skywalker name at the end of that movie and it came out of left field 
they didn't set it up in the earlier part of the movie and they just it was like a throwaway line to justify the title and i'm like no you know no. we're at a point now where with this writer's strike and there's not going to be any content for a while we have to go back and watch older movies just to bide our time and it's the next thing on my new year's resolution list watch well, better movies watch good movie. movies again that are you know a little dated yeah, that's what I was doing um, before I got on here. I was watching a classic. But, um, like, yeah, like, you know, people, we we were talking about this offline. You know, I have friends who are like, yo, Nigel, you're too critical. This, that, and the third. You're only negative. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not the issue here. <laughs> because, you know, we have great movies. You know, there's, we know, there's there's proof that it can be done. On the smaller scale and the larger scale. I mean, we, we've seen plenty of movies that are great. The problem is they're not great anymore. Well, some are. Don't well, get franchises, me wrong. Franchise yeah, franchise movies in particular make it very difficult for it to be yeah. good. Because yeah. mm-hmm. they're blockbusters and there's a lot of studio interference in terms of what can and can't be good. And then that's what kind of like throws off. It's like, all right, we got to make this as blockbuster as possible. Exactly. I I wonder what happened with Andor because Andor is such an outlier. I wonder if they gave him uh, Tony Gilroy. They had to. They gave him full control because they didn't think it would be anything. They just thought it would just be a small drop in a pond. Yeah, and now it's probably the best one. And now everything after is being compared to Andor because Andor was so good. It was so good. And everybody's just holding their breath. What's better, the acting two. or the writing? Gosh. I don't think like you, you can pick you actually have You actually have, like, any type of yeah. caliber acting in there in this Star Wars show, of all things. It's, it's very fascinating. And it's all sides, right? Like, uh, who is the who's the woman who plays Mon Mothma? Man, like, that storyline, I think, is the most compelling part, is her playing the espionage role. Yes, and they they didn't give her that stupid. You hairdo. got action, so you got three different storylines, right? Where you have, uh, was it uh, Lars Skarsgård? Is that his name? No, uh, Stellan Skarsgård. Stellan Skarsgård. Excuse yeah. me. Mm-hmm. You got his storyline, kind of doing his own thing, and then you got Mon Mothma, right? Which is like the political, thrilling, suspenseful thing where she's going to get caught. You got Diego right. Luna's one, which is all the action and the undercover stuff, and. Him kind of like coming out from I didn't want anything to do with it to slowly like I'm buying in, right? You know, and then you had Andy Circus, and there's like all of it's just it's fascinating. Yo, it, it's great. I still remember that line that Stellan Skarsgård says. He says, "I'm fighting for a sunrise I'll never see" or something like that. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, bro! Like that sums up the show itself. It's just gold. It's just. It's beautiful, man. And we actually get to see Forrest Whitaker uh, in there. Because um, I feel like Rogue One, he was great in Rogue One, but it was like, yo, you give me this great, you give me this great character and then you just kill him. you know. <laughs> but we got to see him again. I hope he'll be in uh, Andor season two. But man, like Andor was great. I mean, everything was top notch. The writing, the directing, the acting, the editing. I mean, I watched a whole... Um, podcast about the editing shout out to the editing podcast um yeah it, it's it was top notch it was top tier everybody was on their a game and i feel like lucasfilm was like oh we'll just let them do what we they want in the corner and i think they were doing mandalor mandalorian season three at the time so i think they were putting all their money in the mandalorian and all their time and attention to mandalorian they was like oh we'll let them play with you know that rogue one and or crap you know we'll let them play That's and then it turns cool. out <laughs> Like they got, it's like Emmy nominated worthy type stuff, and uh, I just love it. I'm about to like rewatch the whole season again. It was so great, man, so great. I love it. And then we get Mando three after that, and then we got current Ahsoka after that. Yeah. So speaking of, uh, how you liking Starfield? Oh, love it, bro. Love it, man. Um, I told you the other day that um, 
people are playing it as a space sim and they're um what's it called they're going from planet to planet without jumping so they're taking hours there was there was a i think it was a chick uh starfield player who traveled to earth's moon in the game took her seven hours real time and i was like why <laughs> some people are mad that you can fast travel they're mad that it's not a full-blown space sim and i'm like i'm sorry but i got things to do i'm a grown man like space is big <laughs> space is very big and apparently is expanding so space is very big so oh it's expanding in starfield uh no in uh real space oh yeah yeah, with dark matter. Anyone watches Rick and Morty? There was this episode where Jerry and his wife Beth. You know, they know that Beth is is there's a clone of her or the real version, whatever it is. She comes down for some Thanksgiving thing, whatever it is, and um, Morty has this video game console from some other planet, and he's playing it. Rick goes to him, he's like, "Oh, what are you playing?" He's like, "Whatever." So he starts playing this space game. It's like shooting asteroids. It's got like low graphics and they think it's ridiculous and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, hype up the realism level to 10. And they do it, right? And come to find out there's no asteroids on the screen and Rick's like, oh, I get it. It's like real space. You'll probably never find an asteroid because it's so big. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you. so you got to remember something. Like, you're like, look, Right now, it takes three days to fly from Earth to the moon, approximately, right? Right. What makes you think that anyone would have the time or they would want to, I guess, design something, which you can do, but there's nothing in between a lot of this stuff, all right? Like, that's just how it works. Like, the chances of you running into something in space is so much lower than being struck by lightning 10 times and winning the lottery, walking out of the gas station. Like, that's just how it is. That's how big it is. You know, it's, and I, I just feel like no matter how good something is, there's always some kind of criticism, but I feel like when something's bad, you get a lot more accolades versus something that's good. And they just can't take something that's good. Even if it slapped them in the face. I, I totally agree. It's weird to me. Again, Maybe we can't understand it because you and I have lives. We have wives. We have jobs. We have hobbies. We do things. You know, we're not going to spend seven hours on a game. Literally just traveling, doing nothing, pressing nothing. up on the joystick for seven hours, bro. <laughs> like, I'd rather curl my mustache and watch it grow. <laughs> like, I'm like, are, are you crazy or something, man? Like, do you go to the movies and complain? that interstellar there was too much jumping in the movie that you know there wasn't enough time you didn't see them travel to each part planet. of the pond that would be too much empty space <laughs> like are you did you complain that you know oh they went to the next day in the next scene you didn't see the characters wake up in the morning and brush their teeth take a shower you know do a bm like where's the line people like i don't <laughs> And this is this is a game where you can do what you want, right? Like if you want to play it as a space sim, you can. Clearly you can. You can travel to any planet as long as you want. Or you can um you could do jumps quick time. You could do shooting missions. And each planet, anything. like here's the thing, each planet is beautifully made in terms of you can go to there's different like environments and sections that you go to. So there's a boundary in one section, but then just go in another section instead of just walking through it. Like that's the whole point. Yes. So you can do whatever you want with this game. So I'm like, why are you complaining? You know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to fast travel, you don't have to. If you do want to fast travel, you can. If you don't want to shoot people, you don't have to. If you want to shoot people as a pirate and steal ships, you can. Do what you want. Stop complaining. They literally gave you a sandbox. Playing it. These Shut are up. the uh, these are the same people that we talked to about yesterday with their uh, watching their wives with other dudes. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. <laughs> so, I'm oh my gosh, that. there's some sick people in this world. But I... I'm one of them. But come on, guys. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know. So, there's some really uh, no, sick but no, you're right. And um, that's the great part about it. 
I mean, I would love to talk about the story. I think the game's been out long enough. Most people should have played the main story. It's great. The premise is great. You can, you know, play it over and over again. Changes things every time you do it. You know, it's it's a multiversal yeah. thing. Like that's the best part about it, right? Like when I guess I guess the part for me that's interesting is like they could have gone the alien route, but instead they decided to go the interstellar route, where all of the pieces that are being plucked around are actually people who are yeah. traveling through the multiverse medium. And that's kind of how this is. Like that's cool. Like I like that. For once, we don't have it's to have different. like. Obviously, there's aliens because these different creatures live on these different planets, right? But in terms of sentient life and understanding about God and all that stuff, like. It kind of awesome. reminds me of this game called Killzone back in the day on the PS2. Yeah, I remember Killzone. Where it was like the aliens, quote unquote, were just humans who, uh, what, migrated from Earth thousands of years ago, went to, I think it was Mars, and they mutated on Mars and then they went to attack earth so it's like it's humans against humans as usual but it's just like different kinds. different spin yeah different spin you know kind of like, like avatar where it's like different they're all navi but it's like different but it's just of... tribalism at its finest right yeah it's just how it is. yeah tribalism yeah that's what it is but yeah like i i like it man i like the cinematics um uh, of it you know the i like we talked about this before. Like, I like how in the game, for the for the music, they went the more orchestral approach, kind of like the movie Interstellar, you know, with a lot of strings and stuff like that, a grand orchestra playing instead of like the kind of traditional sci-fi, boom, 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 you know, kind of music. You know, they went more cinematic and orchestral, and it kind of really immersed me in there. And um, yeah, I can't wait to finish the um, story and just go around and um just go around and do whatever you know get so you know stuff. like you hop so when you hop into a different universe and you finish the game like you can there are chances of the universe changing completely in terms of who you interact with and all that stuff right mm -hmm. i think there's like 10 different scenarios i find i did it i did the main story where you collect all the artifacts blah blah 10 times I only had one different variation of the universe and it was very fascinating to me because I thought I was going to like it, like the variation. Mm -hmm. And I realized like, you know what? This is kind of like weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, and if anyone's interested of in all the different variations, you can just Google it um, and just go from there. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a dope game, man. I, we need more like it, a more complete game because I'm tired of the half-finished uh, live service games that we've been getting for the past like what 10 years well destiny started that yeah yeah it's we need to move destiny on destiny is kind of like the life service loot type of thing you know that really just spr springboarded that whole genre which look destiny's great it's just gotten to a point where if so many other games are trying to like mimic the the blueprint of it and it just doesn't really sit right it's like you know well the whole industry like, is trying to copy and it's just come on man come on what are we doing like and destiny itself i thought was like a good premise it just i'm not a live service guy i'm not a battle royale it guy. falls flat because it's very repetitive in a lot of ways and it doesn't yeah. really want to engage your intention it's a looter shooter yeah i mean that's fun it's just gotta have like the content needs to be everlasting <laughs> in a lot of ways you know and it's yeah it's like and if it is and if you are doing live services like you have you have access to the fact that you can just put in patches anytime you want and do these updates like you should have like a whole band of content instead of forcing people to pay for all of it yep yep very true very true but um you you suggested a movie that we should watch that i feel like is pretty un Un, what's it called underrated people forget about it but you know it's lawless and yes. while i was re-watching this movie i've seen it before i was just like dad this is a good movie man like, how how did this just like slip through the cracks and i haven't remembered it like it's it's so solid it's so good great cast great story i mean, I mean it's it's just stacked, man. Like, I mean, we got Shia LaBeouf, Tom Hardy, Jason Clark, Shia LaBeouf. Jessica Chastain. Shia LaBeouf did a good job. 
Oh my gosh. Leo <laughs> LaBeef. LaBeef. <laughs> oh my gosh. That'll never get old to me. <laughs> but Shia, I mean, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf, he was up to his antics again. I mean, in this movie, this you know, I feel sorry for the guy because he struck stardom so early, and that kind of can make you spiral. And how many people who started off young that ended up being kind of normal? Mm-hmm. Let's go through this list real fast. Is DiCaprio normal? Somewhat, yeah. Okay. Besides the fact he dates nineteen-year-olds and he's forty-six, <laughs> I know, and he cuts them out. What at twenty-five? It's not even. It gets a little too old. It's like Rod Stewart, what he did with all his ten wives. Toby McGuire. Yeah, he's he's pretty normal. Toby McGuire kind of disappeared after Spider Man. I think he was just done with the whole like uh And well he won an Oscar with Sea Biscuit, right? So he showed he can do it. Right. And right. like you know, he, he went he's behind a great the actor after Spider Man. Yeah. Started his own company. But dude, and... he's he's a great actor. Like yeah. Yeah. fantastic actor. Um but no, Making... it's either they either disappear from Hollywood, right? Mm-hmm. Like Jonathan Taylor Thomas, you know, oh, Haley yeah. Joel Osment, like take your pick. Or Haley Joel Osment's get, coming like, back. I know he is. I've seen him in, you know, mm-hmm. a few different things. So it was, but, um, or you kind of get the Mary Kate and, you know, Ashley Olsen type of thing. Amanda where it's Bynes. Just like, <laughs> yeah, Amanda Bynes, like the Disney stardom, you know, Demi Lovato. Like, Britney Spears. Yeah, all that just stuff, right? <laughs> People are just like tortured and demented because, dude, you get that stardom quick. Like most adults can even handle it. Like you give it to a kid who's not even emotionally like grown yet, and it's just it changes things, right? So for him, it's yeah. you know he got stardom relatively early, and what do you think was going to happen? Yeah, I mean, not to start this on a sour note, but yeah, I mean he was. This was right before Fury. Um, he great movie. Never seen it. He um, and I know. I already, I already know. I already know. That's on my list. Um, and I just watched an interview with uh, David Ayer, the director, who's a great director. Great job. It's a shame what happened to him with Warner Brothers. But uh, yeah, like he was talking about that movie. But Shia LaBeouf, I know. I heard reports about the Fury set with him. Causing issues and having fights. Yes, that's why Same I call the beef. <laughs> the same, beef same thing with this movie. There's reports that he was actually drinking moonshine while filming this film, and uh, he got in a fight with Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy, who is currently who was um, bulking up for Dark Knight Rises during this movie, um. I wouldn't want to get in a fight with that guy, all right? Especially when he had to train for martial arts in the UF, the martial art movie, too, the mixed martial art movie. Yes, the fighter. I mean, not the yes. fighter. Warrior. 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 Dude, like, Great movie. he's a lunatic. I would not want to fight that, dude. Nah. Nah. So, um, and, and Tom Hardy's, like, he's a relatively normal guy, and he's also, like, a no-nonsense guy. Like, I've seen interviews where people try to Ask him about, but he's not stuff. in a whole lot of stuff anymore. It's like, I mean, his, the man I got guess... his money. He was like Hollywood's biggest guy in the early 2010s, and he's chilling. Like he he got his money. He's, I don't know. I feel like when you work ten years straight, like he did, you're due for a little time off. Spend some time with your kids, especially because he talks about in plenty of interviews how the way he bulked up for Dark Knight, he um he did some damage to his body and. He can't do certain things anymore. Um, putting on that much muscle and that short of a time span can take a toll on your body, and it clearly did to him. Yeah, because so. how he did it, it's like, as you can tell, like he wasn't like super ripped. He was just a big dude, right, who's yeah. just really strong. And I'm like, dude, that is just – the only person I know who can successfully do that to their body is Christian Bale, but you can see how weird Christian Bale is. Yeah, and Tom Hardy, before that movie, he was in a movie called, I think it's called Legend, where he played, like, a, the real-life um, bare-knuckle boxer or whatever. And he was ripped for that. But in Dark Knight Rises, he just wanted to be big. So along with putting on muscle, he, he ate a bunch of junk food, too. 
to get that kind of like just big massive yeah yeah, just just a whole bunch of mass and he said yeah it took a toll on his body he can't hold his kids the way he used to and stuff i'm like that's a shame you know that's kind of like a warning to people not to do that kind of stuff but yeah like i wouldn't want to get in a fight with him shia labeouf (laughs) apparently did and i mean what was it last uh um Last time we were talking about Jason Clark, man. Jason Clark. I love that guy, man. He kills it. Another guy who kind of like was the biggest it guy in the early 2010s. and Because he, he was like, in oh. Zero Dark 32, right? Oh, yeah. Zero Dark 30 has a stack cast, too. And he was in that. Speaking of Jessica Chastain, she's in it. And it's like they've done a few movies now. Yep, yep. Like this this cast is crazy, including Guy Pierce. You know, we were talking about him all the time. Oh, Guy Pierce, such an underrated actor, dude. Yes, such underrated. He's a force, man. Like, I love that guy. And he was in one of Nolan's bigger, uh, first big productions, uh, Memento. And yes. it just, that just sh- that showed how um, Guy Pierce was just a guy with a lot of range, man. And he could just pull anything off. Um, fun fact, Guy Pierce was a, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's like a slim bodybuilder. So it's not like a bulk bodybuilder. He was a slim bodybuilder back in the day. So, Interesting. Fun fact. But yeah, I mean, Lawless, man. Jeez. Great movie based on a true story about Prohibition. And I loved it. And I forgot, uh, what was it? Daryl Dehane? Dehane is in that movie? Dehan. Uh-huh. Dehan. Is in this movie, you know, but yeah, like it very was, young Dean DeHaan, <laughs> yeah, very, very young, but it was great, man. It and uh, about the prohibition, it showed a little bit how um, the prohibition started, um, street racing. Gary Oldman also in this movie for a, a, like a small role, it looked like he shot it all his stuff in a day or two, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was barely in the movie, but he was great in it, as always. The man is a force. But it it was a great movie. And retired. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't think there's anything bad I can say about Lawless. That's how good no, it was. It's very good. It's uh, we don't talk about it in terms of like period pieces or any of that stuff that we should, right? But right. it's just like in the nondescript like southern town, like Franklin County. Okay, but like no one knows where that's at. You know what I mean? So it's just. You could kind of have it as a Western if you want. And it kind of was. Like, Prohibition era was a Western for a lot of Southeast, Southern states. You know, like, that's just how it was. And this really did a good job of uh, really humanizing, like, guys that you wouldn't root for otherwise. That's true. But um, I feel like America does love vigilantes. I mean, we are descendants of vigilantes themselves you know america broke from the british empire and ever since that we've always loved the rebels the underdogs the vigilantes you know that's why we like um we like star wars we like superheroes you know we like the um the revolutionaries you know the muhammad ali's the people who stir up stuff the bruce lee's you know we we America loves that. So to see a movie like this with people who are clearly clearly in the wrong, but you just root for them, you're like, oh, I hope this doesn't happen to them. I hope they don't find the distillery. Oh, they found them. Oh, the cash flow is gone. You know. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to interrupt. So I'm going to tell you something right now. Shale Beef is in a movie that's in post production right now called Megalopolis. Oh. I'm going to tell you the cast real fast. You ready? Yeah. Guess who's directing this first off? Francis Ford Coppola. Ford Coppola. Mm. First off, the greatest filmmaker ever in the history of movies, right? I mean, you said it. <laughs> Adam Driver, <laughs> Aubrey Plaza, Forrest Whitaker, Shia LaBeef, Jason Schwartzman, John Carlo Esposito, Dustin Hoffman, John Voight, Lawrence Fishburne. DB Sweeney, like, yeah, bro, what are we doing with this? Yeah, that's why I'm like, who, what is this about? An architect wants to rebuild New York City as a utopia following a devastating disaster. 
bro, are you telling me that Dustin Hoffman's all the way down on this list and he was like the eighth person mentioned? What in the world? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know who Natalie uh, Emmanuel is, though. Oh, From she's Game, Game of Thrones. Thrones. Okay, I know who she is. And yeah, Fast yeah. and Furious, too. That franchise, too. Aubrey Plaza, James Remar, Talia Shire, who's also the sister of Francis Ford Coppola, who's also Adrian. Hey, Adrian, you know, I did it. You know, that's she played Adrian and everything. Are you surprised uh, yeah. he's still making movies given how old he is? Yes. I think he, I think a lot of older, um, Older uh, directors are trying to make a comeback, but they're all succeeding. I mean, Ridley Scott's a different guy, but um, you know, he's <laughs> dying from dementia. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're horrible! <laughs> but yeah, like um, everybody's uh, everybody's up in this movie, man. You know who I didn't realize was way up there? Steven Spielberg. Side note, Steven Spielberg has aged like wine, man. Because I didn't realize how old this guy was. 75? Nah, he's older, isn't he? Like, this guy's been in the business forever. And he's like, he's up there. I, I know he's not 80. I know that. But he's close to 80. 79. No, no, 77, 77. 77, 77. Bro, this guy. He will be. He will be seventy-seven in December. But no. dude, his movies too, like very good. You know, like yeah. And he yeah. writes a lot of his movies too. Mm -hmm. I heard a rumor um, that um he just shows up on set, doesn't storyboard anything, doesn't have a shot list. He just figures the shot on set on that day, and boom, 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 boom. Works. I'm I like, can't knock any of that. Bro, this man. Is a beast. So, so here, here's here's his last. He's done Lincoln, Bridge of Spies, good movie. BFG, The Post, West Side Story, good one. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones, Munich. Didn't know he did Munich. That was a good movie. Mm -hmm. War of the Worlds. Didn't know he did that. The Terminal. Didn't know he did that either. Catch Me If You Can. Probably forgot he did that. Minority Report. AI. No. Yep. Saving Private Ryan. Everyone knows that. Armistad, Schindler's List, everyone knows that. Cheese is what a movie. God, that's like, that's such a tough movie to watch. But man, Ray Fiennes is probably like, that's probably a top five performance of any acted movie ever, if you've mm. ever seen it. No. About the Holocaust and a sympathetic. Yeah, I, I tried um, a few years ago when I was in film school. And I was like, oh, I don't think I'm in the right mind state to watch this movie. <laughs> That's a t it's a tough movie to watch. You're like, okay, you know, like there's. I think I got in the first thirty minutes or something like that, and I was like, maybe another time. I mean, Steven Spielberg's <laughs> done a really good job, really characterizing the Holocaust in the sense that you know he really like look. It's so long ago now. Like a lot of people just like find they use it as a loose comparison of stuff now and it's like no it's not and then his movies do a good job really like hammering home like that was just evil well, he, he's good at that right he he did, he also did Amistad and um the color purple you know he's color really purple's good too yeah he's really good at telling people's tragedy you know he he um he definitely he knows how it. to hook you in with that yeah, and I think it's because he he talks to people who either experienced it or have experiences in that realm, and he asks for feedback. He's really good at that, and I think that's key when you're, especially if you're doing a story of something you haven't experienced, and there's people around who could give you insight on that. He's pretty open to talk to people and get their insight on that, so I think that's really good. You know, that just he shows also is directing the Napoleon time. miniseries. Which is interesting because there's a Napoleon movie coming out with Jack Nicholson's and yeah, Jack Nicholson's in the show, but um Joaquin Phoenix is in the movie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But who's doing the movie? Ridley Scott. Okay. Now here's the thing with Ridley Scott, right? <laughs> as long as you give him like 
boundaries in terms of like this is what you're talking about he does great like historical pieces he's phenomenal but if you start giving him like but that's control over crazy stuff it's a little too much that's the thing though no one's giving this guy like uh boundaries everybody just let him do whatever he wants to do and then he gets mad when people don't see his movies now to be fair napoleon's coming out in november Anybody I ever heard who talked about it is saying they're going to see it. So I think Napoleon's going to be a big one for a really Scott. But again, I don't see anybody giving him any pushback on anything. And we'll see how that works out for him when it comes to Napoleon. Because it could go... I feel like Napoleon's going to be a precursor to what Gladiator might be. Because it's a period piece, it's about war, it's about a... Yeah, but it's based on something that has happened. Gladiator is still fantasy. To be fair, Gladiator, the first Gladiator was supposed to be about a real event, but it was like historical fiction at its finest, like Braveheart. Based on a certain time period with certain characters that weren't really in that time period, that they kind of fudged some things. Well, they fudged a lot, you know. So it was like historical fiction at its finest. And I kind of like historical fiction. I kind of like when people take liberties with it to tell a good story, you know, just to let the audience know, like, this isn't really true, but could have happened, you know, like, um, what's his name? Quentin Tarantino takes it to the like umpteenth level. But like, like, really, Scott. You mean I, I think... Inglorious Bastards was <laughs> taking it to the umpteenth level? Is what you're saying? I remember watching that, and I was like, oh, they actually killed Hitler. <laughs> like, yeah, they shot him like a hundred times. Yeah, and then they blew the whole place up. I'm like, oh yeah, he's definitely dead. <laughs> There's, he's definitely dead in this movie. Even with the latest one that came out, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, that was good. Yeah, with the Manson killer. It was uh Killings. well the ending was good. I felt the the movie itself was kind of it was okay, you know. But um, no, yeah, he good. definitely took he he definitely took liberties with that, you know. Well, yeah, because it didn't happen in any of them. <laughs> Bruce Lee was just like his characterization of Bruce Lee was great, and his family, Bruce Lee's family, had a huge problem with like I'm like come on, all right, like. You're in well, Hollywood in the seventies. Like, what do you think you were going to be? You know, let's well, that's be their father, man. But um, people who watched the movie and had criticism of it. I'm like, if you watch the movie, um, Bruce Lee in the movie is being described from Cliff Booth's perspective about a fight that happened in the past. So it's not really Bruce Lee himself. No, it's like <laughs> it's a it's a it's a figment of how he already sees Bruce yeah. Lee. <laughs> characterized in the recalling of the events so if he sees him as a complete like tool he's going to recall him as a yeah. tool. yeah it's like hearing a story about a guy that you never met from the guy who beat up the guy you dude never that met. casting was perfect though <laughs> who um mike of Mo? everyone in there oh okay yeah yeah man because damian lewis great. played um what's his name what's his oh, i can't believe it dude. i know who you're i know who you're talking about Oh, I forgot. I, was it Steve McQueen? Big time action guy, drove fast cars, Steve McQueen? Mustang. Steve McQueen, thank you. Yes, yes. That was great. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a good it was a good movie. It was good. Not my favorite Quentin Tarantino, but it was good. But um yeah. So he, so I'm curious. The guy who directed all this, I'm looking at his credentials. He hasn't really done. done. Huh? Why? What's going on? You do such a good one memorable movie and everything else. Like, how do you? What's the secret for you making multiple memorable movies? Like, we're talking about Francis Paul, right? Like, arguably the greatest filmmaker of all time. Like, he's got a Hall of Fame resume before the '90s, you know. And then he just has slam dunks of other movies. So, how do you do it? I mean, a lot of the directors we talk about today, um, like you and I. They started out in a time where the studios didn't cause too much interference and they allowed artists to be artists. Of course, there was some pushback with budget and limitations of technology at the time. But for the most part, there wasn't a lot of oversight. I feel like now 
studios, not just one that we continue to talk about, but studios in general feel like they know how to make movies better than the people they hire to make movies. And so we get all this interference. All Certain filmmakers, I think, have complete control, as you can tell. Then even right, like that just comes with it. Like, you know, if you have Steve, like, let's just say Steven Spielberg didn't have his own production company and someone just hired him on. Mm-hmm. What are the chances that he would take anything from the studio at that point? I feel like he would just walk off set if they didn't because he's Steven Spielberg, even without DreamWorks, which is his studio. He's Steven Spielberg. The Fred Capone. Amblin right? is Amblin is his is his studio. So too. he's making this movie. What are the chances that someone's telling him how to make this? I think zero. But we've already established Spielberg is the kind of guy who wants feedback from the people he's working with. So there's the difference too. Like I feel like Steven Spielberg has one thing, has the one thing every di- great director should have is emotional intelligence. I feel like he knows to ask for help when he needs it. And I feel like he knows when to ask people about experience. Hey, does this line work? Da, 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 da. You know, but um, yeah, like if you get like, a director who's just like, I'm going to do it my way. And the studio doesn't interfere or no one else interferes. You're just going to get their interpretation. But Spielberg is going to ask for feedback. Um, But um, like there's great directors now who have pretty much, pretty much carte blanche, like Denis Villeneuve, Christopher Nolan, people like that. But again, they started off with a movie that they did that they, the studio didn't really give them too much pushback, I believe, because it wasn't meant to be as big as it turned out to be. And then because now, of that, do you think you should get more? Con- do you think you should get more credit for movie success if you're the writer or the director? I think both, because mo- movies are a collaborative art. You know, unless there are different, there are certain situations where a um. A, a writer will come in and just change the scope. Like they'll be like, yo, this isn't working. They'll bring in a new writer. I mean, David Ayer, uh, the director we were just talking about, he himself is the main reason why the, the fast and furious, the very first fast and furious movie was a success because it just wasn't working. They brought him in to fix the script. He changed the location to Los Angeles. He changed it to like people who he, he actually knew as opposed to these like archetypes that the, uh, the original script had. Um, so, um, I mean, J- Josh Whedon was a script doctor back in the day. Um, Carrie Fisher, Princess Leia herself made a career as a script doctor. Like there's plenty of script doctors now, but, um, like, yeah, I mean, it depends on what happens. Sometimes, uh, the director comes in and not only directs, but also, does some script treatment to fix it up for the for the production. So, I mean, there's ebbs and flows of who you can give credit to, but for the most part, I do believe it's a collaborative art because if you could have the you could have a great cast, a great director, and then the editor could fuck it up. Or you could have a great editor, but you can't really edit trash. You could have like a bad director, bad actor, and then it's like the editors are like, well, I mean, it's, I have to have them on screen. I can't just have like B roll the whole time. So, you know, so it's a collaborative art. And, you know, once you have everybody on their A game, you get magic like Lawless. I feel like everybody was on their A game there, even the costume department for Lawless, like the introduction of Jessica Chastain's character. You know, she comes in, what, like 10, 15 minutes into the movie. You already got a sense of what this town is like, the people are like. And then they walk into the bar and she's wearing this bright, vibrant, baby blue dress with her red hair and red lipstick. And you're like, oh, yeah, this chick's not from here. You know, (laughs) that's that's the work of the director, the the costuming department to be like, look, we got to. We got to introduce this character in a way of like, let's tell the audience she's not from here without telling them she's not from here. Right. So her, her, her clothes actually fit her body. You know, they're very bright. She's very bright. 
and she has this way about how she conducts herself because we've seen a little bit of the kind of women that are in this town as opposed to how she acts around men she kind of knows how men are and you can see it so it's like that's a that's like when everybody's on their a game the actors the costumes the directing you know this character without her opening her mouth at first and then what's his name tom hardy and jason clark their characters walk in they're like looking at her like who are you and she's like hey i heard you need help around here is the job still available it's like uh yeah sure you know <laughs> and they're all like taken aback everybody in the bar is taken aback by this chick and she clearly doesn't fit in but um yeah that's just everybody in their a game you know you get a you get a um you get a, a scene like that that shows you how to compose a great scene and how to sh how to introduce a character in a way that hey movies are a great way to show you instead of tell you show when you can show me show me don't tell me don't give me all this dialogue you know we're not a marvel movie where we have to have all this exposition you know but oh yeah this is happening because the quantum and then the, and then yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the entanglements yeah, yeah. you know all this sci-fi kind of like has a really bad or like tenant you know habit of that oh yeah that that bullet did that because it was going backwards because you know time is like all right all right calm down all right <laughs> show me don't tell me you know what I want to see? I want to see Paul Rudd as a bad guy, like a menacing bad guy. <laughs> Side note, speaking of Paul Rudd as a bad guy, I saw, I, I just watched a movie where he was a bad guy for like five minutes. But um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mayhem, I saw that movie. And it's funny, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a charming movie. And in that movie, he plays Mondo Mecco, uh, Mondo Gecko. Um, Paul Rudd, and it was great. His character is great. He's like this, this surfer dude gecko, who's like just befriends the turtles. He's like, oh. So the so the next movie I told you that we should uh, that you should watch is The Count of Monte Cristo, right? Mm -hmm. The director, you're gonna like who the director is. It's Kevin Reynolds from Waterworld. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'm gonna check it out. All right. I, I would say we should check out Waterworld, but I know you ain't going there, bro. I've already... I <laughs> If I never see Kevin Costner again with a mullet again, I'd be happy. <laughs> you, you you don't think he was rocking it, man? He didn't pull it off? Uh, man, I, I'm just... I mean, it's not terribly rated in terms of... Like, I think it's just time has made it more bearable for people. You know what I mean? To watch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why a movie like that did so bad? Well, where do you want me to begin? Because uh, I've watched like behind the scenes. Because they spent movie. a lot of money on it. When they didn't have to. You know, in, fun fact, Steven Spielberg tried to warn Kevin Costner not to shoot it where on the coast of Australia or something like that. He was like, no, shoot it at Hawaii for less money. And he refused. And then they built all those elaborate sets that were beautiful. And the next day, monsoon or a hurricane happened. Because they did they shot it during hurricane season. They shot the whole movie. <laughs> so the hurricane just blew the sets and they had to rebuild everything from the ground up. I'm like, if a if a guy knows what he's talking about, listen to him, man. Listen to him. I don't know. Not not to mention that um Kevin Costner demanded that he have his own condo or something like that near the sets and then be boated on a luxury boat or something like that to the sets it was like yo every day i'm like come on man like kevin costner at the time was running on a high like he was he was killing it in hollywood and i mean he was very costly at the time that cost of production uh the sets, obviously. The fact that... God, I don't want to blame Kevin Costner. It was a lot of choices that Kevin Costner demanded that cost the studio and the production a lot of money. Let's just say that. you know. And uh, a lot of rewrites that didn't make sense. Um, 
the way the studio had them chop up the movie in post. Yeah, it was it was it was it was a perfect Kevin Reynolds has done a lot of Kevin Costner movies. Yeah, yeah. Apparently Robin they're Hood. still cool. They're still friends. You know. They did Robin Hood. Did you see that one? Uh way, way back in the day. Way, 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 yeah. With um what's his name? Morgan Freeman in there. Morgan Freeman has looked like he's been eighty year old, eighty years old for like sixty years. <laughs> he I didn't mean same. he uh he also did one eight seven with Samuel Jackson. Oh never never seen it, never heard it. But Samuel the Beast Jackson of War has a bunch of those kind of movies. Beast of War. Never Tristan and he sold. Oh, Tristan and he sold. Okay. Hatfields and McCoys. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's been on Hatfield and McCoys. And I know he's been doing I know he's directed some episodes of Yellowstone, I think it is. Oh well, yeah, Kevin Costner's done, you know, he was starring that until recently. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's done some of that. But yeah, and then they, he was in the uh he was in the he directed the movie Risen with Joseph Fiennes. Risen with Joseph. Tom Felton, Peter Firth. Nah, not ring a bell. It's about I think it's about the crucifixion of Jesus on the Romans point of view. Oh, oh that's an interesting take. That's an interesting take. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you might want to check out this trailer called The Book of Clarence. <laughs> it's about it's starring um Keith Stanfield. Look Keith Stanfield. And Benedict and... Cumberbatch. Oh really? <laughs> I didn't see him in a trailer. But um so, Jan- James, James McAvoy's in, it. in there too. James McAvoy played but a role. Benedict in it. Cumberbatch is the main guy in this. And the Book of Clarence? Yeah. No, it's Lakeith Stanfield. Look at IMDb. If you look at the trailer, it's Lakeith Stanfield. The book. I see the trailer. What is yeah. this about? It's about um. Lakeith Stanford plays a guy who who's like witnessing Jesus do all these miracles, and he's like, "I want to be that guy." So after Jesus is crucified. Um, Clarence pretends to be the next messiah. And it's the the movie's about like, oh, what happens when this guy is um gets gets all this attention and people believe that he's messiah, what's all the repercussions after that? So it, it looked funny. It looked interesting. I was like, I'll check it out. Is this you supposed know? to be funny? Yeah, like it's like a comedy. Like He's like, oh, I want to be, I want to be that guy, you know. And he's like, oh, this is a miracle. I got, look at this, this is magic. And like, oh, you're oh funny. my god, it's supposed and to so, come out January in 2024. Do you believe that timeline? Nah, nah. And then it's like uh, the, it, it's also about like the Romans, James McAvoy's character, the Romans. They're like, what are we going to do about this next Messiah? Like, we got another one coming in. It's like, oh snap! <laughs> like he, now he gets the attention of the Romans now. So yeah, it looks interesting. <laughs> it looks funny, and uh, it's directed by uh, James Samuel. It's Diamond. completed. Oh well, then yeah, it's gonna come out. If it's done, it's already done. If it's done, it's gonna come out. I think the studio is gonna bank on the fact that the strike might be over by then, so the actors might be able to promote the film. But I wouldn't put my money on that. I like how they kept it smart and didn't give jesus a face jesus just has a hood on and you cannot see his face and maybe benedict cumberbatch is the voice of that jesus in the movie but uh because he's not in the trailer so i'm like which character he's playing but uh yeah every time they show jesus in the trailer he's just a hood he could also be the roman emperor he could be caesar he could be because i'm looking at this cast and they're not telling you who all these people who's who (laughs) yeah (laughs) But I know in the trailer, Lakeith Stanford plays the titular character of um, Clarence. And James McAvoy, I suspect, is um, Pontius Pilate. Or he's just another Roman general that who's like, we got to get rid of um, the next Messiah. You know, but... Yeah, 
<laughs> There's a lot of African actors in here. Yeah. Yeah. You don't usually see that many. You know what I mean? Unless it's like typecasted for that. Do you mean like African African or do like you mean African American? Yeah, so like like David Ola- Yellow. Ola- yeah. Oh, you mean African like African descent. Yeah. 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 I mean the director James Samuel, he directed The Heart of They Fall, the Western with all the black actors. You know, so it's like I've never seen production. that. Was that good? On Netflix? Oh yeah, it's good, man. It's good. With uh Idris Elba. Oh, I've seen that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jonathan Majors. That, yeah. Yep, yep. You know, the Heart of They Fall. Yeah, it's it's dope. So I mean the Middle East had plenty of black people back then. So <laughs> And apparently that is true. there was a guy named Clarence there. <laughs> Might as well just a very put interesting in name. There. <laughs> a very interesting name, Clarence. <laughs> the Book of Clarence. <laughs> Out of all the names they chose, they chose Clarence. Oh my god. <laughs> I want to be that guy. I want to be the next Jesus. guy. <laughs> I think it's like a play on um I'm just guessing here, folks. I think that it's a play on like the modern mindset of people who are just trying to be internet sensations overnight so they're just doing crazy stuff <laughs> like wild stuff and twerking and pranks and stuff on youtube and tiktok so because they they in the trail they they had like his buddy clarence's friend is like i'll help you out and so he pretends to be blind and then he's like i'll heal you he takes off his blood he's like, i'm healed i can see it oh yeah i feel like it's like a, a take on it's What's like a, going? it's like Mel, it's like a Mel Brooks type of thing. It sounds yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a historical comedy fiction, historical fiction. Mel comedy. Brooks did parodies like that all the time. Yeah. I'm trying to think of Robin Hood, Men in Tights, the Book of History too. I think it's called yeah. the Book of the World or something like that. But yeah, Mel Brooks was good for that, <laughs> you know, historical fiction comedy. You know which which was a good historical fiction comedy, uh, Year One, starring Jack Black and Michael Sarah. That movie was hilarious. I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> it was hilarious, and I I thought it was funny because it like follow it went through like so many events in the Bible, and like they come across the snake and everything. They come across Cain and Abel. <laughs> It's like hilarious, and then they go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they witness the, the um, the fall of the city and stuff. Like it's, it's it's very. I I really like those historical fiction uh, comedies, and so the Book of Clarence. I'm gonna look out for that in January. Nice, but yeah, it looks good. Well, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to your take on Count of Monte Cristo. Oh yeah, what a with a young Henry Cavill in there, I see. Yes. Full disclosure, I've never seen Monte Cristo yet, The Count of Monte Cristo. Or read so, the book? No, no. Come By great. Alexander Dumas, the man who wrote um, The Three Musketeers. Black man. Correct. Yes. Very so infamous uh, French writer yep. in the Romantic era. Yep, yep. Very good writer. A lot of people who've read his stuff says, like, The Count of Monte Cristo is top tier compared to the yes. three musketeers yes because everybody knows the three musketeers but everybody's like no it's the count of monte cristo it's the best it's where it's at yes so it's I'm like it it, no it's like um you know it's like the hunchback of notre dame right where it's tragedy it's it, it very it, it, it parallels like the that story par- excuse me parallels with this there's lots hmm. of betrayal you know and then there's vengeance and you know like the, it's a classic guy from nothing gets rich and you know takes revenge sounds like my kind of movie my friend <laughs> i like that i like those revenge like the punisher john wick yes. you know yes. the guys who come off the brink of death and then they're like hey i'm back you know <laughs> let's I'm go than ever remember that time and no one knows filming? who he is which is even better like he he reveals his identity at the end to his to guy pierce which is great awesome awesome i'm gonna check it out but yeah my nomads this was another good one thanks for hanging in there be creative peace